exceptionally tired today, and I think that every day, but you look good, so that's nice. Because sometimes when you're speaking and you look out and you see people and you're like, ooh, you guys look good, so you don't have to worry about that. But one thing I did want to mention to you guys is sometimes you might think that I can't see you. But yesterday, there were at least three people who picked their nose, and one person who ate it. So, you might want to, as you're sitting there considering what we're talking about, also consider what's happening here and here and here. It's very important, because it's kind of distracting to me. And I'm talking and you're like, hmm. So, anyway. Think about that, and if you have to do that, for my benefit, just hold off for 20 minutes. Um, 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, this morning we're going to talk about a story um, that you can read about in 2 Kings 22 or 2 Chronicles 34, um, and it's about a period in uh, Judah's history um, that's, that's very interesting. And after the, the rule of Solomon, Israel was divided into two distinct kingdoms. In the north there was Israel, and in the south there was uh, this land called Judah. And in the south there was one really major advantage of living in what was called the southern kingdom, and that was that Jerusalem was there, and that meant that the temple of God was there. And worship happened in this temple, and so if you were striving to, to follow the one true God, and if you were trying to live for him, that was the place to be. It was very important for you to have access. And sadly, there were bunches and bunches of evil kings, one right after another, right after another, another awful leaders, just um, consistently through this period, who were pointing the people away from God and kind of diminishing uh, the call to be set apart and to worship and to, to live for the Lord. But nonetheless, while this was going on and while these evil kings were, were leading the people, worship continued to happen in the temple. There were still uh, religious activities. The priests were still there. They were still all um, going through and doing a lot of the things that they had always done there. And in the midst of, of this situation, a young man named Josiah became the king. And he actually became the king when he was only eight years old, which is pretty phenomenal. And the Bible, when it talks about Josiah, says that there was no other king before him or after him who followed God's word more closely. That's a pretty good endorsement for someone to say, there was no leader, no king, before or after him that followed God's word more closely. And here's a man who, unlike his father and his father's father and the kings before him, followed the Lord and was willing to do what it took to put him first in his life. And so like I mentioned before, he became king when he was only eight years old, and he began to seek the Lord, even in the midst of this difficult situation, when he was only 16. And this made him see that it wasn't good uh, to worship other gods, it wasn't right for the land to, to have all these other places of worship, and to have the one true God worshipped alongside of a bunch of other idols and pagan gods. And so he decided that he was going to change, change things, and he had any place of worship that wasn't to the one true God torn down. He wanted to set God apart and, and let the people know that he was really the one who should be worshipped above everyone else. And one day, when he had been reigning, he had been king for quite a while, 26 years into his reign, he asked the high priest to start organizing some repairs on the temple. They had been saving up money and collecting it, and Josiah thought, this is a great time for us to start you know, turning things around and repairing the temple and making it into what it used to be, this great magnificent place where people could come and worship the Lord. So the priests and the people who were working with them started cleaning and repairing, you know, taking things out of the closets, reorganizing, scrubbing the floors, and what the Bible says is that somewhere along the way, maybe it was in a dusty closet or maybe it had fallen down somewhere, uh, they found something. And what they found was the book of the law. They found God's word and it had been missing, it had been lost, 
and no one had even noticed. Now that is, that is amazing that that kind of thing could happen, that the temple had been functioning, people had been coming to hear teaching, songs were being sung, there were sacrifices going on, but God's word was missing. And when it went missing, they didn't go frantically searching for it. They didn't turn the temple upside down to try and find where did it go. They just didn't even know that it was gone. And when you think about how that could possibly happen, you have to wonder, well, what kind of things are the things that people don't notice when they go missing? And those are the things that you don't use, the things that you don't really care about, the things that you don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. The things that you don't have to worry about maintaining or having as a regular part of your life, those are the things that you don't notice when they go missing. And amazingly, when this happened, it was like they were saying, well, well it didn't matter. The Word of God didn't matter for their lives. And this is kind of a, a side note, something for you to think about as we continue in this message. But I would be curious for, for you guys... If someone took the Bible out of your life, if someone went into your dorm room or your backpack or wherever and, and took the Bible away, how long would it be until you were like, oh no, it's gone? How much do you rely on it? How much do you need it? Would you notice if God's Word went missing from your life? And to kind of illustrate sometimes how this, how frantically we search for things that are important for us. Um, some of you guys know my brother and he just got married a little while ago and when they were planning to get married and, and everything was coming together right before the wedding, they, they had their, their plans all worked out. Get married, do the ceremony, then they were going to fly out and go on their honeymoon and they were going out of the country and he lost his passport. <laughs> So, coming up right before the wedding, a couple days before, all of a sudden they discover Sean doesn't know where his passport is. And if he didn't find it, what would happen for the honeymoon? She would go without him. Right, either she would go without him and that would be difficult, or they wouldn't go, which would be sad because they spend a bunch of money, or they'd go somewhere that wasn't as good, or most likely they would just be upset. Um, you know, they just wouldn't be good. So what did they do? What do you think they did when they found out that he lost his passport? They turned the house upside down. Yes, they turned everything upside down. In fact, he didn't just look for it. He told a bunch of people. Um, and he wasn't the only one looking through stuff. Um, there were other people trying to help him find it because he was so concerned about having it so that they could go and do what they were planning to do. It was essential for his trip, and he knew it. Now how much more important is the Word of God in our life, or how much more important was the Word of God in the life of the people of Judah for everything that they did, day in and day out, than a passport is important for one trip that you go on one time? It's so much more important, and yet somehow we just miss that sometimes. And what happened you know, as we continue this story of, with Josiah, is they found God's word and this was good, but it wasn't enough for them to just have it. After that, the high priest gave it to the king's officer, and he read it to King Josiah. Josiah was smart enough to know that the, the word of God isn't something that you just own, but it's something that you need to read, it's something that you need to know, it's something that you need to soak up. Because he understood that that the Word of God is the message and the instructor, instruction from the Creator of everything. That the Word of God is God's perfect plan and design for how you should live your life. That the Word of God is the direction that we all need. And Josiah was hungry to know what it said. So he read it and he was affected. In fact, what the Bible says is that he tore his robes and he despaired because he knew that God wasn't pleased with the way that God's people were living. They had abandoned him. They knew that it was wrong, and they did it anyway. And so when he recognized how they were living and the, the, the lifestyle that was prevalent in his kingdom, he decided he was going to repent, and he chose to turn his life around, and he wanted to help other people to do the same thing as well. So he gathered all the people, it says, all the people of his whole kingdom he gathered together. And he had the word of God read to them from start 
to finish. Randy has told me a few times this week that I've been talking a little bit too long. But could you imagine if I read the whole Word of God from start to finish? It would be, it would be completely different. And that's what he, he had going on. He, he brought all the people of the whole kingdom together and had them uh, listen to the entire Word of God that had been given up to that point. And then after that, he, in front of all the people, pledged that he would obey and follow the Lord. And he called all of the people to do the same thing. To make a long story short, Josiah chose to apply what's got, what God's word said. So he continued to repair the temple. He wiped out the rest of the idol worship going on in Judah. He restored correct worship according to what the scrolls that, that they found said. And he reinstated the Passover celebrations so that they could be honoring God according to what God was calling them to do. And he consistently encouraged the people to focus on and to obey the Lord. Of what happened in this story, we can see that at a young age, Josiah was a person who was seeking the Lord. And that when he encountered God's word, he repented for the way that he lived his life and the way that he led other people. And then he applied God's word so that it would affect the way that he moved forward. And every one of us is in a position to do one or more of all of those things, to seek the Lord, to repent, or to apply the word in a way that's, that will affect the way that we move forward. And if you think about what it means to seek the Lord, we need to understand that, that God's word is an invitation to you. When you encounter what scripture has to say, it's amazing because God didn't just hand it down for no particular reason. He is infinitely wise and he knew that, God's, that his word was perfect for your life. And when you encounter God's word, when, when you read what scripture has to say, it's an invitation for you to live a life in accordance with God's commands. It's an invitation for you to know him more. You know, when we talk about the gospel, which we've done quite a bit so far this week, we recognize that God called us to follow him, that, that Jesus died for us, that he invited us to be a, a part of his family while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies. One of you mentioned last night at sing time that Acts 17 teaches us that, that God is near to, the, to us and if we would just reach out, he's there. He wants to be found. And not, this is true because of what Jesus has done. He has made it possible for you to come close to God. To come close to the perfect, holy, mighty ruler of the universe because of what Jesus has done. And when you think about the gospel, a lot of times we think of it only as an event. We think of the gospel as this story of something that happened. That Jesus came, that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again. And that is the gospel story, but the gospel is not just an event. The gospel is an invitation. And what God calls each of us to do is to seek him. Beyond seeking the Lord, it's important for us to repent. When we come face to face with God's commands and what he calls us to do, it means that we need to change, that we need to turn around. Some people think that Jesus' whole ministry, that his whole purpose is summed up in one verse in Mark 1.15, which says, The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. And that's, that's what God calls each of us to do. To turn away from our sins, to recognize that the way that, that we have been living, to recognize that living for anything other than Jesus is a waste. To turn away from that and devote our lives like Josiah did. To say, we are going to follow the Lord and we are not going to be stopped in doing that. And we are going to encourage and call other people to do the same thing. And we are going to set an example. We're going to repent. And we're going to follow because of the good news. Because Jesus has invited us into his own family. And because he empowers us to be people who can love him and know him and live for him. If you're a person who hasn't been seeking the Lord, it's, in it's important for you to do that for your own sake. And if you're a person who, has, who knows God and, and hasn't been living for Him, it's important for you to repent, 
to turn around for your own sake, for your own good. Because God wants to live closely with you. And when you're embracing sin, and when you're embracing selfishness, you are not embracing a close walk with the God who wants to know you and be near you all the time. Josiah did one other thing. He applied the Word of God to his life. And Jesus talks quite a bit about this. And we, hear, we can hear his words from Luke chapter 6 where he says this, Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Jesus asks this question, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? And I would just like for you guys to consider that for your own life. Many of you are people who follow Jesus with, with what you say. You, you do a great job singing to him and you know all the right answers in your devotionals and you have great discussions and maybe we can even get together some nights and have intriguing theological discussions which I like, but the question about that for us is, are we calling him Lord? Are we talking about him? Are we saying the right things about him, but not doing what he calls us to do? Are we people who are in that boat, who call Jesus our Lord, but then don't do what he says? There's a pretty good uh, illustration that we can think about for this, and that is the idea of going to a doctor. If you go to a doctor, you do that because you believe that he can help you when you're sick. So if you were to go to a doctor and he were to prescribe some medication to you and you, you went and got those pills and you, you know, put them in your medicine cabinet and then never took them, you wouldn't probably get the effect of the pills. You wouldn't get any better. If you don't take the pills, no matter if you have them, you don't actually get the benefit. If you don't take the medication, if you don't apply it to your life, there's no result. Sadly, this in this story, Jesus talks about people who are doing that kind of thing with his word. It's like we come to Jesus to know what he has to say to us, and then we hear his teaching and we say, that's good. And then we just turn around and do our own thing instead of applying it to our life. And if we go around not applying what Jesus has to say, it's almost like we're saying one of two things. Either we're saying we don't really care about him, or we're saying we don't really believe him. And those kind of things are very telling about our relationship with God. They're very telling about how much we really care about him. They're really telling about if we actually think that Jesus is our Lord. We need to be people who don't just call him Lord, but people who actually live as if he is the boss of our life. Where what he says goes, where we are happy to follow him because we trust that what he has to say is good and right and meaningful and beneficial for each of us. What Jesus says here is the people who do follow him, the people who are living as if he's the Lord, are the people who put his words into practice, the people who listen and then put it into action. And he says those people are, are like people who build with a firm foundation, build their house on a firm foundation so that when life storms come, they can stand. And there's a few different kinds of storms that each of us face. We, we all go through difficult things in our lives. Some of you guys have experienced uh, all kinds of difficult things on the family level. Some of you, ha your parents have gotten divorced. Some of you have had other kinds of family struggles. Some of you have, uh, have, have had health problems or other things going on. And if you just think in your own life, I don't need to go down the list. We all know that life is filled with struggles. 
But it's great to know that when we follow Christ, that we can stand firm through the storm. He doesn't say that the storm won't hit our house. He doesn't say that the hard times won't come our way. But he does promise that when we build our lives on the firm foundation of his word, that our lives will not fall apart. Whereas if we don't, he says, when the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. It's important for us to be people who build our lives on the Word of God. And the way that we do that is by putting into practice what He teaches for us. And then another type of storm that we all ultimately will face is death. You guys are young, mostly healthy people. But the truth is that, that this life that we live is short. And we don't know how long it's going to be. We don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to end. But we do know one thing. It's going to end. That's going to happen for each and every one of us. And that is the, the ultimate storm. In the book of, of Hebrews, it tells that, us that that's something that that every person fears to some level, death. If you build your life on God's Word, even death doesn't cause you to fear. And even that storm is something that you can you can stand firm against through the power and strength and love of Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we, we see that demonstrated where he says, you know, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting. And if we're not building our lives on the Word of God, if we're not applying Jesus' teaching to our lives, you can guarantee that death is going to have a, a big victory. And its sting is going to hurt. But, if you're following Jesus, if you're trusting in Him, if you're hearing His Word and applying it to your own life, you can stand against anything, even the most difficult things. And that's an amazing promise for all of us. So now we need to think about what does it actually mean for us to, to put God's Word into practice? What does it mean to build our life, our dreams, our choices on Christ? And that all comes down to knowing His Word and then being willing to actually do it. And the Holy Spirit is amazing and He empowers us and He's with us and He, he gives us strength and wisdom to know how to follow Christ. And there's some great tools that you guys can use to constantly be close to what, what's, what God's Word and what His teaching has to say for each and every one of us. Bibles are very accessible. Beyond that, when you go home and you get your technology back, there's amazing apps that can keep you connected to what God's Word has to say. Um, if you have a smartphone, you have no excuse for not reading the Bible every day. Um, you have less than no excuse because there, there's some great stuff out there with, with awesome reading plans and, and helpful reminders and, and things that, that can connect you with being able to memorize Scripture and get it into your own life. All those kinds of things. And, and if you guys have questions about some of those things and, and how you might find them or what they are, you can talk to me at whenever I'm around. Um, there's so many good tools and, and you should have them. There are people out there who want to encourage people just like you by connecting you more closely with God's Word. Let's take advantage of those things. But even if you don't have that kind of technology, God has given you His Word in the way that He's given it for a reason. And it's very accessible for all of us. Let me, let me end with this. Um, this is just a final note. You might have been walking closely with God once. That doesn't mean that you are right now. There may have been a time in your life when you felt like your relationship with Jesus was like on the money and, and you, were, you knew him and, and you loved what he had to say and you felt close to the Lord and maybe you've drifted away a little bit. That happens sometimes. And, and that even happened to King Josiah. Remember we said in the beginning that he was somebody who, 
who God said followed his word better than any of the kings before or after him. But the way that his life ended was really tragic. He ended up dying because he chose not to obey God. And you can read about that sometime if you want in Second Chronicles 35.22. You don't have to look that up right now, but uh, there, was, there was tragic results in his life for not trusting, not obeying, not... He called God Lord and he didn't, he didn't live like he was his Lord at that point. And there was a tragic result. And we, I don't want that to be the case for any of you guys. Just because you once were close to Jesus doesn't mean that you're walking closely with him now. And you need to examine where you are and take stock of where you are right now and not just where you once were. So if you need to seek him, seek him. And if you need to repent, don't waste your time. And if you're not putting his words into practice, make a change. Make a change. God is not up there wagging his finger and being angry at you, saying, how dare you run away from me? He's saying, come back to me. So I'm just going to read 1 John 1, 8 through 9, and I'm going to be done. But I hope that you will con consider this. Where do you stand? Are you a person who's putting Jesus' words into action in your own life? Or are you a person who's just calling him Lord? God's word says, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your word and for the direction that it gives our lives and how we can know you through your word. And God, I pray for the students who are here today and I ask that you would be working in, the, in their lives to help them know what your word has to say about how they should live. And I ask that you would give them strength to apply it. God, we love you and we want to love you with how we live our lives. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me.